Thank you very much. It's, it's nice to be here. Am I, am I on and wired and everybody hear me? Okay. I've spoken over the years to uh, several different schools, but it occurred to me when I was preparing this that this is the first time I've uh, spoken at an ACC school other than Chapel Hill. Um, so I was telling some of my idiot friends that story, and they gave me all kinds of suggestions about how I should handle this situation. One, one friend suggested that I should wear a Clemson cap, which seemed kind of like pandering. Um, another suggested I should wear a Carolina cap, which <coughs> seemed kind of stupid. Um, so here I am hatless with my, uh, my skin cancer um, for everybody to see. If you don't remember anything else about what I talk about today, remember this. When you are picking your mother, if you want good skin at the age of 64, do not pick a red-headed Irish woman named McCarthy. <laughs> I want to do two things today, and, and I think they're in some ways related. Since this is a Charles Fraser lecture, I want to talk some about that and about him and some of the earliest lessons that I took from him that, that in some ways are really only, I have only kind of figured out in, in the last 10 years or so, although um, I've been gone from there for 35 or 36 years. Then I also want to spend some time talking about the more general subject of the creative process and how you manage that and, and the lessons I've learned along the way about, about that process. I have found over the years that it is an incredibly misunderstood process and I've been lucky enough to have been exposed to it uh, in a, a couple of times in my life, once with Charles and, and once for the several years I ran Walt Disney Imagineering. I've developed some views and some attitudes about it, and um, I have some feelings about what does and doesn't work, and I, I hope they're meaningful. I want to start very carefully with a comparison. Unfortunately, most of you did not know Charles, but what is interesting is, what was interesting about him is as much about what he wasn't as what he was. And just to tie it to the second part of my speech, I want to contrast him a little bit with what was generally considered one of the great creative minds of the 20th century in Walt Disney. I knew Charles well, but never met Walt Disney. Walt died in 1967. But I spent 13 years at Disney and in senior executive roles, and the lore and the richness of, of him was so rich in the company that I feel like I knew him reasonably well. I don't want to do either man an injustice by forcing comparisons or trying to reach conclusions just for the sake of tying things in a neat bow, but I do think there are a couple things about both men that have stuck with me. Both men were in the classic process sense poor managers, but both men also had an endless sense of the possible. Charles flew at about 50,000 feet most of the time, and that was certainly where he was the most comfortable. And as, as effective as he was there, God help you sometimes when he came in for a landing. <laughs> Walt was much the same way. He was always looking for new ideas and new ways to think about things. He was pushing the envelope all the time in how people were entertaining themselves and what the new entertainment mediums were going to be. In a way, Charles was doing with land what Walt was doing with film and animation. And Walt then, as you all know, even ventured into the three-dimensional world in, in, when he got involved with inventing what became the theme park. It really, just as a way you can, also, you can also argue that Charles invented what today we all know as the resort golf course community. It really, it's hard to imagine because it's always been around, but it didn't exist in the form it is today before the 1960s. But the more interesting comparison is that, I, I want to make a couple other comparisons. 
Charles insisted on surrounding himself with the best and the brightest people, but he also insisted that they be young. I'm sure you've heard the story about in 1973, the Sea Pines Company was the largest recruiter at the Harvard Business School. So everybody was smart, everybody was inquisitive, everybody was credentialed, but they weren't seasoned or experienced. Walt, on the other hand, had a similar, had a similar bias that was even more dangerous in that he was famous surrounding, for surrounding himself with people who would agree with him for yes people. After he died, the company almost went bankrupt. And the reason, the reason was because all of the management that had been left were the people who had been used to just agreeing with Walt. And they literally spent most of a decade looking at every problem and trying to figure out. And they would look at every problem, not in terms of the reality of the problem, but they would look at it and say, what would Walt have done? That's not how you solve today's problems. So in the, the comparison is that you had you had one person who surrounded himself with incredibly bright people, but people who didn't have the experience to go with that. You had another man equally creative, equally adventuresome, equally difficult to manage, who surrounded himself with people who weren't willing to argue with him. Either one of those cases was a dangerous extreme. And they were both risk takers to the extreme. Everybody, anybody who knows anything about sort of Hollywood knows the stories about Walt Disney. He literally bet the company on Snow White in the 1940s and, and did it several times after that. Charles kind of did the same thing. He, he went on a project acquisition spree in the, 19, in the early 1970s that was in retrospect ill-timed and developed a, developed a portfolio that was far, far bigger than our balance sheet at the time could support. I remember that some things just kind of stick in your head. I remember we were having a banker's meeting. This must have been 1975 or 76. We were having a banker's meeting uh, when all the bankers were coming together. And this is when it was obvious that, that uh, our appetite had overtaken us and that things were not working well. Charles loved maps. And, and he, he had a collection of historic maps, but he also just loved project maps. And we had a... We had a wall in the, uh, like this in the conference room that was covered with the maps of all the projects, and mostly in the southeast. And there were, there were map, there were pins in the maps where you could, you could see where the projects were. Well, the, uh, either the night or early that morning, Charles had gotten the idea of taking those maps down, and, and, and he put up a map of the world that was huge. And on that map of the world, he took the same pins and put the pins in South Carolina and Georgia and Puerto Rico showing, showing where our, where our uh, projects were. And, and the, the bankers walked into the room worried that Charles had too big an appetite and saw his map of the world. And I'm convinced that that was the beginning of the end. So the lessons, the lessons are obvious. Dreamers have to have controls. But controllers also have to have dreams. But the other thing I'm going to talk about in a minute, and, and I am more sure of than ever, is that controllers are easier to find than dreamers. So you need both. One side's pretty easy to find. The other side is incredibly rare. But it's how you mix them together and how you match them that is the secret to success in what I want to talk about. So let me talk about some lessons from Sea Pines and Charles. People tend to think of him, and Terry, Terry referenced it in his introduction, they tend to think about him environmentally, uh, planning, design, all of which were certainly leading edge. But the more I think about the, the life experiences that I got from him, they, they really don't have anything to do with that. There, the, there are some more general observations I'd like to make that I think, as I said earlier, I think have really taken me years and years to, to really understand. And I'd, I'd put them in kind of three categories. 
The first one is, the first one is about balance. I think everybody who was at Sea Pines at the time with me uh, would agree that we were we were there at a point in time. It was it was a it was a point in time with a man with enormous energy and big ideas who decided that he wanted to grow and he wanted the best and the brightest around him to help him do that. This was 10 years before David Halberstam wrote the book about the Kennedy years that had the title. But I think if, I think if, if you'd written a book about, about Charles uh, mimicking that title, it would have to be, as I said earlier, the brightest with no experience. I don't include myself in that brightest category, but I thank God I slipped through because it was a once in a lifetime experience and just proves no screening process is perfect. But it was a mistake. And the important thing to take away from that was that it was a mistake. He recruited from Harvard and Wharton and Chicago almost exclusively and paid enormous attention to education and credentials, but gave little credit to experience. And I think part of that, and I, and I spent a lot of time with Charles later, and, and so I, and I've talked to him, I talked to him about this. I think part of it was that he was concerned that experience would narrow your thinking and that it would put blinders on you and make you less adventuresome. And I think in, in retrospect, he probably was right. But the reality is that a little less adventuresomeness, if that's a word, would probably have been a healthy thing as we went into the downturn in the mid-1970s. And it's a tough lesson for those of you here who are students because what you're selling is brains, not experience. But I think it's important that you, that you realize that. The lesson here is don't discount experience and don't, don't get yourself, particularly as a student, don't get yourself into a position where you can't get the best of both. Get yourself somewhere with somebody who appreciates experience and appreciates what you bring, but also appreciates, but also puts you in a position where there are men and women that you can learn from. It's a shame, it's a shame in, in some ways, but the, the hard truth is that the only way you get experience to a large degree is to, ex is to live it and to experience it. But anything you can garner early with having that, without having to go through it, you are going to be miles ahead for. So pay attention to it, and it's an incredibly important part of any career you think about and any job you start thinking about taking. The second, the second lesson from Charles, I think, is simpler, and it's about energy. He had more energy than anybody I ever met. And I have found today that it's something that I judge people by. And I'm pretty sure I can trace it back to my early days with him. He had boundless energy, and so you, you, you had to have it just to keep up with him or you got trampled. And, but I think, and, I, and I, even I find today that, that I make some kind of a simple correlation between just sheer raw energy and the ability to get things done. It's not a very sophisticated way to look at the world, but most of you know that a lot of what we do in our daily lives is not nuclear physics. It's just getting things done. It's taking a list and getting it done and working through it. And it's sticking to it and doing the hard things and doing the easy things. That takes energy. Energy doesn't mean that you're a type A person who can't sit still and listen. Energy means that you push to get organized, you push to go the extra mile, and when you see an opportunity, you push a little further and see what happens. People who think about energy as an attitude often confuse progress and motion. This is not about that. People with energy can take naps, but you don't take a nap on second base. You take a nap in the dugout. The third issue is what I would call the general category of questions. Questions, 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 and then answers, answers, answers. I have never met anybody who read more than Charles. He was prolific, he was consumed by it, he always had a book or a magazine with him, and it was a, 
it, it was a pride. And, and, and having dinner with him was like trying to play, like playing stump the band because he would, he loved to bring up subjects and, and test you sometimes. And he, and, he, and he knew just an incredible amount about um, a multitude of things. And, and if, even if he didn't, he was a hell of a bluffer. And, and, I think, and, and I think could intimidate you into at least moving on to another subject. But what it also gave him was an ability to connect dots. And, it, and there, there's an ability to see patterns in, in, in seemingly abstract things. And, and the thing that made his mind so fertile was the thing that made him connect those dots in ways you wouldn't normally think about. And that is part of the fundamental definition of creativity. I think it's where the creative process starts. It's, it's not only seeing what's there, it's what's, seen what's, what, it's what's seen what's not there. And it's a simple rule of thumb that the more dots you have to connect, the more ability you have to sort of rearrange those stars and do it in some kind of an interesting way. So I think it was, it was, it was part of who he was and it was part of what made him what he was. So with that, I want to turn more generally to the creative process and talk about some lessons I've learned in my life about how you manage that process and some things that I think work and don't work. In this new world economy, managers, management purpose has to be to bring together the three components of the creative process, resources, talent, and ideas, in order to build new and better realities. And that's the challenge of any process. And it's the objective of any company or any institution, like a university. Whatever you do, whichever corner of the economy you're in, we must all become more centered on the creative process and acknowledge that it is a process. The two words together, creative process, should be equally linked. Creativity without process is often a failure. Process without creativity is a white wall. So, I thought it might be interesting to talk about how you, at least in my experience, I have created and managed a creative process. And I, th and I think, as I said earlier, it applies to any, any experience. This, uh, most of mine is drawn from my experience at Disney, uh, but I think it can apply far more generically. But first, let's start with some definitions. Let's understand, the dif let's understand and distinguish the difference between a great idea in a creative process. We've all had great ideas. It usually involves four or five or eight friends, some kind of a relaxed, unstructured environment, and nine times out of 10, probably a bottle of Chardonnay. <coughs> Typically, somebody mentions an idea. Somebody else picks up on it and embellishes it. All of a sudden, the entire group is focused on where you're going to go on vacation together next year. Or Mary, Mary mentions a new business idea that she has, and by the time the conversation's over, you've taken it, you've twisted it, and turned it, and embellished it, and everybody's convinced they're going to invest in it. Well, we've all had that experience in some form or another. We've also all then had the experience of going home, but not without first vowing in the parking lot that somebody's going to call the travel agent in the morning and book that trip, or that Mary's going to make an appointment with her banker and see what's involved in getting a loan. Then everybody wakes up the next morning, goes to work, and promptly forgets about the entire thing. What you have just had has been a great time with friends, and you may or may, have, may, or may not have had a great idea, but you have not had a creative process. So what does it take to capture this idea, to harness this tree flow of energy, and convert it into something that you can read, or see, or live in, or hear, can be any discipline. Let me take you through a process, at least a process that, that, that I've learned, and see, and see how this creative process breaks down into a more understandable sequence of events. I think there are five phases. The first phase I will call the spark. 
I don't mean to minimize the idea of process I just talked about because it's where everything starts. One of the first things you have to learn and appreciate, particularly when you're, when you're in charge of a creative process of some kind, is that an idea can come from anywhere. Sometimes the idea or the spark can come from the strangest place and you have to be smart enough to recognize it. Sometimes it evolves over time and it grows out of an extended process. I can tell you from my own experience that the lightning bolt is a rarity. More times than not, something starts in one form, that notion it get, gets tugged and pulled, bent and repainted, shaped and reshaped, and ends up in an altered state that actually becomes what then gets labeled as the idea. So running a creative process is a constant exercise in creating a climate that encourages the free flow of break the mold, out of the box ideas, and it's also a constant exercise in establishing the space and structure to channel those ideas into actual processes and products, and that's where the balance comes in. To create that balance, you need three things. First, you need an environment that says, I'm not going to laugh at you. I may laugh with you, but I'm not going to laugh at you. I'm not going to cut you off, and I'm going to listen. An environment where smart people can be comfortable talking to one another. And by smart, I don't mean necessarily the people with the biggest IQs in the room. Big egos and those who see conversation as a contest are usually not very helpful in this idea process. More valuable are people who are inquisitive, people who are observant, and perhaps as much as anything else, people who are willing to listen to somebody else to respond to that idea and then refine it and play with it. The right emotional environment may be one that encourages risk taking and allows failure and in some cases even celebrates failure. The, crea the creative process is by definition an inventing process and it's impossible for all inventions to succeed in their first efforts. You will never get anybody to step out and take a chance if they know that there's a high probability they're going to get shot. At Imagineering, we started an idea, we started something called the Idea Fair every year where we looked at all the projects that were currently underway. Remember, this was a couple thousand people and we were doing things around the world and people tended to work in compartments and, and so we took this opportunity, it was very elaborately staged and it, it, it took time to do and it was expensive, but we thought it was important and it really, it served two purposes. We brought out of the archives and dusted off a certain number of projects that were, that had never been approved. And we found, it, we found it did two things. One, it reinforced the idea that failure was okay. And that in fact, some of the best teams in Imagineering had had ideas that never got funded. Two, it also underlined the idea that oftentimes things fail not because they're fundamentally bad ideas, but because of other circumstances. Timing is a huge part of anything like that. So the motto, it, ac it also actually became a problem. A, it, became, it became part of the mantra of the Disney culture is that you never throw anything away. And we had just these massive archive of things. But it was because we went to such great lengths to celebrate the, the, this idea of possibility. The second thing you have to learn in order to really make this kind of process flow is, that it is to respect the diversity of ideas in a diversity of views. People, people will often kid about somebody having the creativity of an accountant. Well, you know what? Accountants can play a very valuable role in the idea process, but they're most valuable when they're made part of a group, sitting alongside a storyteller and a marketer or a computer pro and a computer programmer, because they each bring a different point of view to the subject. If the ideas between them flow, and if they're all willing to be exposed to the other's point of view, and to take what's there and embellish it and elaborate on it, 
then you may have the potential of having something. The third thing you need in order to cultivate an idea-rich environment is protection during this incubation period. One of the most frustrating things for people who do not understand the creative process is to be told, we don't know when we're going to be ready. As one of my senior creative people at Disney used to say, you can't schedule inspiration. All you can do is have inspirational schedules. Right? That was kind of a cop out, but he, he kept repeating it. <laughs> I think what it really says, uh, but uh, the more I've thought about it, I think it's true. Trying to, force a, trying to force a decision just because somebody sets an artificial timeline can be a disaster. I've seen great ideas killed that way. We all have. It happens because somebody was able to interrupt the process and force a group to show us what you've got before it was ready. We all know business is about schedules. And it's about budgets. So it's not unreasonable to ask somebody to be ready by next Friday or to have an idea of when they can talk about something. But that doesn't work at certain stages in the creative process. If things go right, you could be done early. But it's also equally possible that you won't be. If you can't develop a culture that within reasonable limits understands that ideas obey their own imperative, then it's going to cripple the creative process. So first phase is the spark. Second phase is what I've called stop and go. <clears throat> the next secret of creative management is to know when and how to stop that idea flow I was just celebrating in the first phase. Art has, art has been defined as getting something where you like it and leaving it that way. That's hard to do. Whatever the dynamics, there has to be a point in time when you, when you abandon phase one and somebody has to yell stop. You have to move on to the next major point in the creative process. And this is where the first risk point in the process comes. The second point is when you try and take this idea and convert it into a series of action steps. Typically, there's a point where there has to be some summing up, and then there's some assignment of tasks. You do this, you do that. So that the idea can be broken down into its component parts, and the execution phase can begin. This assignment phase is incredibly important and risky. If assignments aren't made carefully, if they're not made to the right people, if the idea is not really an idea yet, then the assignments will end up being unexecutable, contradictory, or simply too vague to inform intelligent next steps. As soon as you start the transition from the idea to the process part, the environment also has to change. For all the freedom of that first phase, the freewheeling, no holds barred energy of the idea proce process, it now becomes important to start setting up boundaries and fences and constraints. When you start assigning tasks to individuals, you inevitably get questions about schedule and budget and deliverables. By the nature of your answer, you're going to start defining parameters and constraints that are a healthy, necessary part of the creative process at this point, if they're introduced at the right point. Do I have 60 days to work on this or six months? Do I have a million dollar budget or a $10 million budget? As soon as somebody knows their idea can never be more than a million dollar idea, you have eliminated a whole series of alternatives and you have started to introduce efficiency into the process. Curiously now, if you do this at the right point, if you do it when the idea has gelled enough, then you actually help the creative process instead of hindering it. There's nothing more exciting during the original process than a blank piece of paper because it's all about possibility and unbridled opportunity. But as the process matures, you have to start introducing boundaries and there have to be reasonable constraints. Otherwise, the white paper just stays white paper. My definition of phase three, I've called true north. 
it's important in this idea process that you keep a point of reference, a guidepost, a guidepost to keep going back to. As the team, particularly as the team breaks down and starts executing different pieces of the assignment, there needs to be a true north to go back to. It's the only way to maintain the essence and the integrity of the idea. I've found that great ideas can get whittled, diluted, and changed, not through bad intentions, but through the inevitable incremental changes that occur when you don't keep reminding yourself of the original essence and integrity of the idea. Let me give you an example from, from my, my Disney experience. Euro Disney, which is now known as Disneyland Paris. The original idea for uh, Disneyland was, for Disney, um, Disneyland Paris, was to take the Magic Kingdom theme park, Disneyland as most people know it, and put it in the middle of the largest concentration of wealth in the, United, in the world, which is the, th the 350 million people who lived within a one day drive of Paris. The idea was simply to tap that market. The concept was right. But as we got into the execution stage, we lost our focus. We, we, we forgot that what we were really there to do was to build a Disneyland and then see what else happened. We started believing our own noise instead of the, instead of the 2,000 hotel rooms that all the research told us we should have built, we told ourselves, well, we're Disney. And so we built 5,200 rooms on opening day. And instead of building a capacity uh, of X for the theme park, we decided we're Disney. And we built almost 2X capacity for the theme park. And then we put debt on top of it. So a great idea that lost its true north. We forgot why we were there and, and got all caught up in the things that weren't the essence of the idea. Disneyland Paris opened. The idea was exactly right. The European culture embraced the Disney culture and, and it was a success from a gate point of view in terms of the number of people attending from day one. But it was a financial disaster for years because we overbuilt it. We forgot, we forgot the essence of what we were there for. Phase four is, uh, I didn't know what else to call this, so I called it panic. I think there's a, there's a third major risk point that seems to be common in every creative process I've ever seen. I would define it as somewhere between the bottom of the second inning and the top of the third. It's after the team has been together for a little while the idea has begun to gel, and there's a real sense of process around it now, and the product is really beginning to evolve. You can, there's a there there. Enough of the original idea is still intact that there's integrity in the idea, and there's energy behind it, and all the, then all of a sudden, boom. Out of left field comes a bomb of some kind. The lawyers say you've got a huge legal problem. The engineers say it just won't work. The computer programmers say that the technology is two years away. And then of course the finance guy comes in and says you've got to cut the budget by 20%. You're never sure exactly where it's going to come from, which is why they call it a surprise. But I can almost guarantee you in any complicated creative process there's going to be this point in time. I call this section panic because the secret is not to panic. I found that this is a situation, back to my earlier examples, where a little bit of gray hair is really valuable and it really helps to have somebody who's been in this mode 30 or 40 times. The first time you experience this, there's a tendency to panic and throw everything up in the air and run around in circles. And this, that's exactly what you don't do. You need to communicate like you've never communicated before. And you need to go back to the essence of what you had, to your beginning. Check true north. Check the clarity of the original idea. Go back to basics and work your way through it and understand the touch points that were important 
and see if you can find where the noise came in. And this is a point where you have to listen to everybody on the team like you've never listened before. Ask questions, stupid questions, but always, always focus on the essence of the idea. Why did we go to Paris? What, what was the essence of this idea and how much of this other stuff do we really need to make sure that the essence of this idea is still intact? There's usually a way through it if the fundamental idea really was a great fundamental idea to begin with. Then the last phase, which maybe should have been earlier, but I've called a sense of humor. And I, and I think it is, I've thought about this a lot and I've experienced it both with and without it. And I really do think that it is fundamental to the creative process. Businesses are deadly serious things that we all that we all concentrate on. They all have investment returns and shareholder value and debt ratings and market share and all the other things that you do. But I found in the creative process that particularly in the early stages, the idea breaks down completely if you end up taking yourself too seriously. The creative process, in my experience, doesn't work if there isn't a sense of fun, if there isn't a sense of adventure, and if there isn't some kind of a sense of humor about it. I have, I have tried to do this with deadly serious people and I'm about 0 for 5 in the experience. The process depends so much on human interaction. It depends so much on give and take and challenge and arguing and, and laughing and crying and all the other things it takes that, that the, the, process, the process will kill you if you can't, can't step back from it and see the humor in it and see the fun in it and remember why you were there. And it's oftentimes humor that pulls you through that process. We had a, uh, we had a very talented graphic artist at Imagineering who, <coughs> who started, for, for reasons I never quite understood, started doodling. Um, he was also a cartoonist, became a famous cartoonist. But he, this was 20 years ago, he started doodling on his time cards. And you had to log out your time and, and put it in and it would get allocated to projects. And, and, and John would start doodling and the, and the doodles got to the point where they would be about things that were going on. Well, one of the people in accounting decided that they were cute and started posting them on the bulletin board. And so everybody could see John's doodle uh, for that week. It became part of the corporate culture of Imagineering. If something, would, if, if something went wrong someplace, inevitably somebody would say, well, I wonder what John's going to do with this on Friday. And it would be the subject of John's doodle. John was not a huge fan of management. And I tried to kill him a couple of times. But I, but I knew very quickly that I couldn't do it because it was part of the culture. And John and his enthusiasm and his cynicism uh, was an important part of who we are. And he provided... He provided that smile when, thing, when, when, when things weren't sometimes something you wanted to smile about. It was a, it was a lesson to me that I, uh, I learned uh, importantly, and it it's a reminder that it's a strange world out there. It's a funny world out there, and if you can't keep it in perspective, and if you can't keep a sense of humor about it, you're probably not going to be successful in it. Let me finish by pointing out a, a final issue that that I think is a part of the creative process. Uh, I didn't list it as one of the five, but I think, it's, uh, I, I, I think it's critically important. And it's relevant to anybody, whether you're running a business or teaching a class or trying to figure out how to grow an idea or trying to figure out how to grow your career. And I generally would put it under the category of does it fit the franchise? At Disney, we were blessed with one of the strongest franchises in the world and one of the strongest brands in the world. When you ask somebody what the word Disney means to them, you'll get generally a pretty clear set of answers. And they're generally fairly consistent. In the movie, in the movie business, for instance, you'll never hear somebody say, well, I'm going to go to a Universal movie or I'm going to go to a Warner Brothers movie. But you'll often hear people say, I'm going to a Disney movie. That's the power of the, that's the, power of the brand. 
So how do you think about that in your own terms when you're looking at companies, when you're students, when you're thinking about companies that you want to join? You're not going to look at many companies that have a brand with the strength of Disney, but when you're looking at something, what does it have in place? What process does it have in place that, that understands who it is and what it is? If, if there's a fantastic idea there, but they haven't, it hasn't gelled yet, it's not, it look, it, it's not a franchise yet, but you think after studying that it could be, well, then that could be a golden opportunity for you, and it might be worth a flyer. But if it's a company that's just doing whatever works, and they're moving into something else because that's where the cash flow is, and that's where the money is this quarter, then be careful. It may work, it may work for a little while, but, but does it have a franchise? Does it fit a franchise? Or is there a franchise in its foreseeable future that's gonna make sense, that's gonna be something you can build on? A tougher but maybe more relevant question for some of you is, what is my personal franchise? What is my personal brand? Some of you may argue that, that you're not in business yet, so you're a, you're a blank piece of paper. You don't have a brand. But I would argue that to some degree you do. You certainly know what you like and what you don't like. You know whether you like accounting or not. You know whether you like design or not. Those are the beginnings of a personal brand. Those are the things that are gonna define you as you grow in your career more than any specific course you take here or any place else. So I would encourage you to be true to those fundamental, to your fundamental franchise, to your fundamental brand. We all make compromises along the way, just like companies make compromises, because in your case you have silly things like student loans and mortgages and car payments, and I understand that. But if you have to make those compromises, do it within the context of a strategic personal plan and within the context of a franchise. If you, if you spend some time thinking about your personal franchise, you can make some of those inevitable compromises that you're gonna, that you're gonna have to make. But remember my analogy about true north. Find your true north. If you have to go west for a little while because there's a specific reason for it, fine, do that. But, but keep your compass in your pocket. And make getting yourself into a creative situation part of your search. It will complete you, it will make you happier, and it will make you more valuable as you grow. You may be a Charles Frazier or a Walt Disney. Or you may be the anchor to Windward that a Charles or a Walt needs. And they desperately need that to become the real success that they need to be. So figure out, figure out where your strength is. Figure out the parts you play in that. An orchestra is made up of a lot of instruments. Find out what you love to play. And then find an orchestra that plays the music that you love. Thank you. Uh, we certainly invite questions from the audience. Don't hesitate, don't be shy, come on. Any questions? Argue with me. What do I think of Disney Hong Kong? Uh, I haven't seen it. We did the design for it before I left, but I haven't physically been there. I can, but I can tell you the, it's actually an interesting question. And in, in, in as, as you compare the story I just gave you about Euro Disney, which was, was overbuilt, the criticism of, the criticism which they're now fixing of, of Hong Kong Disneyland is it was too small. Uh, and, and the, uh, and so you, so I think the uh, uh, the numbers guys, the constrainers, the 
the, the anchors to windward got hold, got hold of the process, told everybody, now remember Euro Disney, remember we built 3,000 hotel rooms too many, remember we built more capacity than we needed, and tightened it down so tightly that uh, it, was a, it, was a, it was an accommodation problem and it was an experience problem from day one because there wasn't a there there. There wasn't enough there. So in an ironic sense, it's a perfect example of, of overcompensating for something that was done before. They're now in the process of fixing it, but I can tell you, I can tell you that retrofitting a theme park is a very expensive process compared to the original construction of it. So I hadn't actually thought about that context, but it's, a, it's, a, it's another example of trying to find that balance, trying to, trying to, take, a, trying to take somebody, trying to take, a, to my analogy, a Charles or a Walt and, and and, and take that brilliance, but somehow govern it, but not govern it so much that, that you overrule it. And it is, and, and there is no science to it. There is, it is, it is touch, it is feel, it is experience. And, uh, and every time you face it, every time you face the facts, they're getting ready to build another park in Shanghai. And, and how they deal with that is gonna be the sum total of everything that's gone before that. And you don't get this one right. Yes, sir. The question for those that didn't hear it is, what, is, what do I think is the uh, future of the golf course community? I mean, I, I don't want to bring this group down, but uh, <laughs> uh, um, I, I, am, uh, I am very pessimistic. I, uh, um, the United States has, there are, there are about 31,000 golf courses in the world. About 17,000 of them are in the United States. The United States needs about 14 or 15,000 golf courses. There are literally a couple thousand golf courses in the United States that were built not because we needed golf rounds, but because developers needed frontage, particularly in the, particularly in the last 10 years. And, and we now have those couple thousand golf courses that need to get mowed and trimmed and so on and so forth. So you've got a million to $2 million of operating costs every year with memberships that are non-existent or walking away or lagging. It is a, it is a huge problem. I'll tell you where the opportunity is. And I, and I, don't, I don't know how to do this. Um, but there is an opportunity to retrofit golf courses. And there are a few people who are thinking about how to do it. But, but I, I, mean, I really do think that, that, we are, uh, that we are dramatically over-golfed and, and are gonna be that way for some time. Uh, demographics are not in its favor. Uh, it's gotten expensive. But, but doing the retro process is very complicated. You know, you've, you've, got, you've got people with deeded property around the, around the golf course and you've got covenants and restrictions, you've got You've got zoning ordinances, and in some cases, urban areas that have helped fund the golf course, and it, it's very complicated to do. But, but if somebody could figure out um, uh, how, to, how to produce linear gardens or something else in some way that you could make money out of, there's an opportunity there. Uh, there are a couple golf course architects that are trying to think about how to do it. The problem is, the problem with it is there's no blanket solution. There's no, there's no cookie cutter. Each situation is so specific that it's gonna have to be designed to its own. The, the, the extension of that question is the second home business. Um, and the, the second home business, I think, is, uh, is going to be one of the last uh, pieces of this puzzle to come back. Um, despite the rise in the stock market in the, in the last year, everybody's worth 20 to 30 percent less than they were four years ago, and even more importantly than that, they're scared. They've been more scared than they have been in a long time. And the second home, in a lot of ways, is one of the ultimate discretionary investments. And so, if in addition to being scared, if you've seen the value of real estate go down 30 percent in the last couple of years, which it has most places, then you've lost your confidence in the second home as as a part of your estate. Doesn't mean second homes aren't going to sell and they're going to be there, but there are a lot of marginal products that are going to sit for some time, I think. 
Interestingly enough, I think it's probably it probably somebody somebody asked me on the radio earlier what I thought about the future of Hilton Head. I think I think places with a brand and places that are there that are that have the infrastructure in place and have tradition and have grocery stores and have and have habit are probably going to fare pretty well here because because the risk let's face it the risk has been wrung out of Hilton Head. And I, you know if you don't like a forty year old house, we'll tear it down and build another one. And then you're starting to see some gentrification. Um, the, the people that are the people that are in trouble are the people who went out to uh, tertiary locations and, 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 and bet on the margin just because the wind was at their back in 2004. Those are a problem, and there are a lot of them. That was more than you asked for, but. Uh, well, let me take that to be a let me take that to be a little bit of a generic question about about commercial and mixed use environments. Is that is that fair? Um, it's hard to do, and it's hard to do primarily for what I think are some fairly practical reasons. The the there there are some there are some physical limitations that you run into and some cost limitations you run into when you try to strut when you try to stack residential on top of commercial. And you run into just things like structure and pilings and supports and so on and so forth. And if you, if, you, if, you, if you break that rigidity, then you can do it, but it just gets more expensive. But that's the reason you don't see, you don't see retail over, uh, or you don't see residential over a uh, 10,000 square foot um, gap store. Uh, they just, they, it's just very hard to do. It's hard to make it feel Comfortable and it's hard to do it economically and make the and make the uh, make the make the either the stores or the residential work. So what you get oftentimes trapped into is doing things that are fairly small. So so you you by definition start to rule out some of the customer base of commercial tenants that you might normally talk to. That's one of the reasons why you why a lot of these small things tend to end up with mom and pop operations. Some of them work. Some of them work beautifully. Uh, Celebration went through uh, kind of the inevitable two rounds of leases in order to, to find the people who could really work and really thrive in that environment and who were creative and, and, and predictable. Um, but it now works. And, and it is, but it is primarily a small shop, small store, tends to be more entrepreneurial than, than mass retailer. Uh, kind of experience that limits that limits who you can talk to, and it also increases the risk of the tendency that you have. Doesn't mean you can't do it the other way; it's just harder. So uh, you you get you get into some kind of practical traps that you don't think about when you first start. Yes, sir. I, I think that one of the I'm, I'm familiar with a couple of solutions that are going on right now, where they have um, uh, where they have done that. They have uh, uh, we built at at, uh, at St. Joe. We built a uh, with Davis Love uh, a couple of years before I left. We built a a six hole course with three sets of tees. Pure experiment, and and it worked. Uh, it was designed for walking. And, uh, and we, we, we were able to build it in such a way we didn't need cart revenue. We weren't totally dependent on cart revenue. And, and, uh, and it worked. And it was designed for families to go out and play parents and kids and so on and so forth. Uh, or somebody who just wanted to go play six holes or nine holes. Um, there are some cases where people are abandoning back nines. And, uh, or I, I know one case where somebody has abandoned the back five or six and, and, and shortened shortened it into a kind of a, a, a sort of a, a par three. Uh, so I think you're starting to see some of that. But, but the, uh, the world does not need another 7,500 yard course. I, mean, I think that's exactly right.
is 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 is. Absolutely. I think I, th I think I, I think the I think the answer is yes. I think uh, uh, that there's a there's a sense there's a sense of adventure in the company. There's a there's a uh, there's a, a pride of place in the physical in the physical side of the company that uh, that is still there. And there are there are there are, there are no there are no people. I think this is right. There are no people left who actually worked with Wall. But there are enough sons and daughters and second generation people who were schooled in that, who uh, who believe it. And there's a and there's a. I mean, the, the man is an icon. I mean, he is an he is an absolute icon. And 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 his his sense of adventure and his sense of of people and and his sense of of sort of customer care and how you think about the guest is something that's 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 rich in there. And it is and it's. It, I think that's a good way to think about it. It's part of True North. Yes, sir. Would you imagine the guest type of real estate economy in the U.S. over the next five, ten years? I'm, I'm happy to hazard. Would I hazard a guess over the real estate economy in the United States over the next five to ten years? I think increasingly one of the things you have to be careful about is not making U.S. generalizations because I think as we as we, a friend of mine said, the, 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 the only good news about this is that the bad news isn't getting any worse. And I think that's kind of right. Um, but I personally think that we're in for a pretty long slog. But, but I think one of the things that you're already starting to see is that this is not a national story. This is a very regional story. And there are pockets that are starting to appear. I was in Prince William County, Virginia, uh, a couple weeks ago, I'm uh, doing some work with Wells Fargo and was looking at something for them. There are going to be 50,000 jobs created in Prince William County, southern uh, suburban Washington, this year. Ladies and gentlemen, that is unheard of. It's also your tax dollars at work. But, but, but there is a, there is a three-month supply of lots in Prince William County. That's better than it was in 2007. So, so it's very dangerous to talk about a, a, a generalization. And then you can go to Naples, Florida, where there's a 14-month <coughs> supply of lots. And uh, so I think I was saying to the class I talked to earlier that I think when you're thinking about careers, you need to pay attention to geography like you've never paid attention to it before. Because as we come out of this, I think it's going to be very uneven. Uh, I, you know, I. Uh, there is, in the, in the residential lot business, there's movement. There's, there are clearing prices being established and, and things are starting to happen, um, uh, particularly at the, at the lower ends. The, but in terms, of, in terms of office space, in terms of retail, uh, on a macro basis, this is still, to a large degree, uh, employment driven. And, and as long as we've got the equivalent of 17 or 18 percent unemployment between the actual unemployed and the underemployed. Uh, that's an enormous drag on this economy that we haven't seen in a long time, and 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 it's not going to it's not going to change dramatically. Now, the, you know, retail is retail is um, happens happens slower than some of the residential stuff does. Office happens even slower because things fall off in big in big chunks, but but. Somebody talked to me about an office building they were starting today. Um, that's the first story I've heard about an office building starting in quite some time. Um, so there are isolated examples of it, but there's a, um, I think we need to be prepared to, uh, that, that the next few years are going to look a lot like it looks right now. Two more questions. That's a that, that is a great question. It is um, if you're 
if you, uh, we were talking about this in the class earlier, just in terms of sort of where the opportunities are. Um, you know, the classic, the classic development companies um, that have been around for so long um, either aren't there or aren't hiring. They're, they're shrinking or, or have shrunk. Uh, some of the opportunities are going to be institutional. Uh, the largest owners of real estate right now either are or are going to be the banks. Uh, uh, Wells Fargo, which I'm dealing with, is doing, a, uh, a, you know, has had to set up an REO operation, and they don't like doing that, and they, they do as little of it as they can, but they're, they're making arrangements with people all over the country to be asset managers or stewards or, or receivers or whatever the legal term is, and those breed opportunities. Now, those are, those are a, lot of the, a lot of the ones I've seen are kind of boutique kinds of things, but, but I know some of them that are growing and some of them that are looking for people. And, they're, and some of those are looking for, uh, for entry-level people who, who, are, who, who want to get experience, who are willing to roll their sleeves up and do things. You may, have to, you may have to do some things that you don't think are fitting for an MBA, but get over it. Uh, it's a, <coughs> that's, I think, what it's going to take. Uh, so so the, the, um, you know, the big guys aren't coming to campus anymore, probably in the real estate business, other than the banks. And, and that's a place, the banks and the places, the, the banks and the people who are close to the banks are going to be an opportunity for people who want real estate experience for the next few years. And I think they're there, but they're harder to find. And, and, and you've got you've to rely on your network. You've got to rely on uh, the guys who graduated last year who you've kept in touch with uh, through your friends of friends and so on and so forth. And I encourage you to do that. If I could, what I'd like to do now is uh, I would like to introduce uh, Laura Lawton Frazier and uh, her son. And we want to thank you again for, uh, for your father's uh, uh, involvement in creation of great opportunities and economic uh, uh, benefit for the state of South Carolina and throughout the, the country and even the world. And we, we really want to appreciate you. Thank you for being here today. Okay. Thank you. Well, I recall at the beginning of this, there was a discussion about the fact that there was a shortage of a hat at one point. And we've got a Clemson Master of Real Estate Development. All hat right. <laughs> and we also have a very nice gift. And we want to thank Mr. Rommel very much for being here today. And we thank you for attending. Thank you. Thank you.